Ford has announced a Model T moment for electric vehicles, it says. Uh, new approaches to manufacturing and a much lower cost EV. So I'm going to talk to Sam Abelsamid, who is the Vice President of Market Research at Telemetry, about that. Welcome back to uh, Energy Media, Sam. Yeah, it's always good to talk to you, Markham. It is. We, we need to talk more often because there is a lot of stuff happening. I mean, <laughs> and keeping up with what's going on in the EV world or the automotive world uh, generally is is it's a full-time job, as you well know. So yeah, it is my full-time job. It is your full-time job. Well, look, uh, okay, so um, Jim Farley, the CEO of Ford, made the announcement uh, yesterday and said it's a Model T moment for Ford. Your take on that? So uh, what we heard yesterday and and some of the things I've been hearing over the last month or two, uh, it's there's definitely a lot new to Ford that's going on. Uh, we've got a new kind of vehicle architecture for their next generation of EVs. Uh, we've got some, what looks like some pretty substantial updates to their manufacturing process. Uh, but so far, what I'm seeing is not 100% new. Uh, a lot of what we're seeing uh, has already been done, in some cases, by other automakers, uh, and generally not legacy automakers. What, what One thing that is new is that for a legacy automaker, uh, the, pretty much everything we've heard is essentially new. Uh, it's not something that GM or Ford or any of the Europeans have done yet. Um, but uh, it has been done by others. Uh, for example, the vehicle architecture uh, of of this of these new vehicles using a structural battery pack, a couple of large uh, die castings, aluminum die castings for the front and rear structure, and then putting that all together. Um, that was done by Tesla starting in 2022 on the Model Ys that they produce at their Austin, Texas plant with a with their 4680 battery pack. Um, and then it has since been copied by a lot of the Chinese. Um, we don't know if Ford is taking it further beyond what Tesla and the Chinese have done, uh, because those vehicles, uh, if you look at them, they still have the central passenger cell is still made of stamped steel uh, that's been welded together. Uh, but And then the, the aluminum structures are attached to the front and rear, and then the battery comes up from below. We don't know if Ford has gone beyond that, uh, but what they have described has been done before. Similarly, the manufacturing process of... Uh, Putting the um, attaching the seats and the interior and everything to the battery pack and lower, raising that up in through the what would have been the where you'd normally have the floor in the the vehicle body. Now there's just a big hole. You lift the battery pack in there, bolt it in place, seal it up. Um, that again, it's been done before. Um, what and even the uh, what they call the universal EV uh, manufacturing process, their their so-called assembly tree. Ford has kind of done that already with the line where the factory where they build the F-150 Lightning. Uh, you know, they, that, that tree, you know, you've got one, one sub line to do the rear structure, one for the front section and one for the battery section. And then you bring them all together and attach them together. That's basically what they do with the F-150. Uh, although not with that kind of vehicle structure. Um, if you look at the F-150 Lightning factory, the, the cab and bed come in at one end go on to an automated guided vehicle. They install all the interior and the wiring and everything in that from the other, and it moves towards the center of the factory. From the other end of the factory, you have a frame that comes in. They attach the battery pack to that. They attach the motors and the suspension and the brakes to that as it's moving towards the center of the factory. When it gets to the center of the factory, they bolt those all together. It turns right and then goes down a, a third leg of the line where they put on the wheels and the trunk liner and the lights and things like that. So they're already kind of doing some of this. And in fact, uh, I've been telling a couple other people today, um, some of what we're talking about actually goes back to the beginnings of the Model T. When they started the moving assembly line, you didn't have people on the assembly line taking engine parts and assembling an engine in the car as it was going down the line. The engines were assembled on a separate line. Transmissions are assembled on a separate line. Wheels were built on a separate line. And then they bring them to the final assembly line and put it all together. And that's been kind of an evolution from that to where we are today. So not, not as new as it might sound. 
No, that's that's really fascinating because uh, here's why I'm interested in this, Sam, is uh, we spend a lot of time here talking about uh, the ideas of Professor Clay Christensen from the Harvard Business, mm -hmm. Business Review. And he always said that the incumbents will stick with what's profitable and ignore the innovation that comes from the startups that ch that are challenging them until it's too late and then they and then they fail. And so the question then becomes in this context, how quickly can the incumbents uh, either adopt innovations or come up with their own innovations? And from what you're telling me, it's, you know, Ford's kind of finally got there, but others have been there before. And I'm wondering how far behind they are, say, the Chinese, who are, I think, admittedly at the forefront of this. So, um, you know, in this case, Ford actually is doing exactly what Christensen talked about, you know, bringing those uh, innovations some, you know, some of the things that they're innovating are innovations that they've already done, developed themselves internally, that they already did on the Lightning. Um, others, you know, the, like the, the overall vehicle architecture of the large scale castings, and I refuse to call them giga castings or unit castings or mega castings, because those are just nonsense marketing terms. They're just big castings. Um, but using the, the large castings, um, it, where you simplify dramatically simplify the assembly process, that is actually not that it's, it's not they're not that far behind on that. Tesla just did that for the first time three years ago, um, and you know the Chinese within the last three years have been adopting that. So they're actually not not that far behind uh, in that. But they are the first of the legacy brands to go down this path, and I think we will see more from other manufacturers. We may have buried the lead here because uh, Ford announced that it's going to be introducing a $30,000 EV, a mid-sized truck, and that would be fairly big news, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is a truck. Um, overall footprint, uh, they tell us, is roughly the same as the current Ford Maverick, uh, which is available as gas or hybrid, but it's, it, it's a completely different vehicle, but similar in size to that, with a little more interior space, a little more cab space than a Maverick. Um, and uh, you get a frunk, uh, and uh, and then a bed on the back, and the the kinds of things that they've talked about, both in terms of the manufacturing process, the vehicle architecture, those are the kinds of things that they need to do to get that. And there's also a lot of other details that I've kind of glossed over in terms of how they're connecting things, the electronic architecture, the zonal electronic architecture, all of these things add together to significantly bring down the manufacturing cost of the vehicle to the point where they can, I think, I believe they can conceivably uh, sell this vehicle at that $30,000 price point and at the very least not lose money on it, at least break, break even on the base model and, and on up-level models probably uh, make, make a profit on them. So uh, I think they, they are doing the right things and, and they are the first of the, the legacy brands to really go down this particular path. Now, uh, Ford is bringing in uh, lithium iron phosphate batteries, uh, and it's in a partnership with CATL, which is the world's biggest battery manufacturer, a Chinese company. We've seen some innovations coming out of China recently, you know, the, the uh, megawatt charging infrastructure where you can basically get four or 500 kilometers in five minutes of charging. And I'm wondering, will CATL be bringing some of this, uh, their, their innovations like that uh, to this project? Uh, no. Uh, so uh, Ford has licensed uh, some of the manufacturing processes for the LFP batteries from CATL, uh, and then they are building those in their own plant here in Michigan. Um, but it's not going to have a thousand volt uh, electrical architecture. Uh, that does add cost. So it's mm -hmm. going to be a 400 volt architecture, similar to what we see on a lot of other uh, or mo most other vehicles today. Um, so it'll probably charge at a peak of about 200 kilowatts, not a thousand kilowatts. Um, and, and that's, to be honest, that's probably fine for most cases. What about, uh, how does this fit into the, uh, Trump tariffs and the uh, tariffs that he, you know, the, you're a Canadian automotive engineer working down in, in Detroit now, but you know, you come from the Windsor area. And there was a lot of consternation, uh, you know, six months ago when Trump was talking about trying to rehome the uh, the uh, U U.S. auto industry, get it to move from Canada into into the United States. Um, 
And there was a, a, also a lot of debate about whether the OEMs could ever rejig their business model to make money at EVs. So are we seeing that this is in response in part to the Trump tariff pressure or at, is this uh, you know response to uh, Chinese competitive pressure? It's the latter. Um, I mean, these decisions, you know, this 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 development of this product started long before uh, the election campaign. Uh, you know, this the this this came out of the so-called Skunk Works program that Jim Farley established in 2022. Uh, actually, I think it might have even been late 2021. Uh, so uh, this has been in development for three four years now, and uh, it predates that. Uh, the decisions to use the Louisville assembly plant also predate any of that. Um, now, building it in, in Louisville will certainly help uh, from in terms of tariffs, although th they are very likely to still be subject to some tariffs for certainly some of the raw materials, some of the components uh, that may be coming, you know, for example, those large aluminum castings, that aluminum has got to come from somewhere that will probably be imported and be subject to some substantial tariffs, um, a lot of the steel as well. So they're there will be some tariff impact on it, um, even though the vehicle is being assembled in Kentucky. Um, where do we go from where do we go from here? Uh, I'm kind of curious. Oh, I know what I wanted to ask you. Uh, you mentioned Skunk Works, and this is something that's come up uh, over the last 20, 30 years. And we mentioned uh, Christensen. The idea, the incumbent, because it's difficult to innovate in a big company like Ford, they established this Skunk Works unit on the side to innovate. And then once the Skunk Works team has come up with some innovations, then try to bring it into the, the bigger company. Is that what's happened here? That is what has or what they're trying to do. Um, the problem is the, the latter part of that process of you know, doing, doing that uh, stuff outside of the larger organization and then bringing it back into the organization. It's bringing it back in that has traditionally been a problem for anyone that tries to do this, not just Ford. Um, if you rem remember back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, Roger Smith, then CEO of General Motors, established Saturn Corporation to develop a new way to design and build and sell cars, small cars, uh, profitably to compete against the Japanese at that time. And uh, they, they did that. They set up basically an entire separate business within GM. They built their own factories. They set up their own retail network. And then when they tried to bring those lessons back into GM, it just didn't work. Um, they, they couldn't do it. And Ford, even more recently with Team Edison, uh, was established in 2017 to try to build, try to develop a um, commercially viable EV business. Um, and, you know, they pivoted and ultimately built the, the Mach-E and the Lightning and the E-Transit, um, which were you know, really good products. Mm -hmm. But um, even that, couldn't they, couldn't they couldn't figure out the commercial viability part of it, the getting the cost down. And so then they built a Skunk Works off their Skunk Works, a, se a second level Skunk Works, which is doing this now. And so we'll, we'll see. It's going to be challenging uh, to bring the lessons of this prog program back into the larger organization. Now, if, if uh, Farley is correct and they can sell a, a midsize pickup truck at $30,000, uh, surely now this is a, at least a, a reasonably affordable vehicle. I mean, how much lower do you have to go in price uh, to be com competitive uh, with in North America? Surely $30,000 uh is it. Yeah, I mean, at that at that point, at thirty thousand dollars, that's thirty thousand U.S. dollars, um, which I think is about three hundred thousand Canadian right now. <laughs> <laughs> but th at thirty thousand dollars, that that puts it right in between where the current gas Maverick and the um, the Ranger are. Uh, so they're they're more compact and they're rid, um, mid-sized pickup trucks. The Maverick starts at uh, a little over twenty-eight thousand dollars. The Ranger starts at about thirty-three-five. So it is that would be fully price competitive without any kind of incentives. That's just a straight up sticker price competitive with their uh, internal combustion equivalent vehicles. What about, uh, well, did Ford mention anything about competing internationally? Because we've seen China is moving into the global South in a, in a big way, not only exporting uh, uh, EVs, 
but also building manufacturing plants, assembly plants, uh, that kind of thing. Um, any hint that this might be part of, you know, their be moved into Ford's international operations to compete with the Chinese at some point? So for political reasons, I think mean, right now, they don't want to talk about anything, doing anything outside of the United States. The announcement yesterday was all about Kentucky and Michigan, uh, the battery plant and the assembly plant. That was the 100% focus. That said, I 100% expect Ford to adopt the same kind of vehicle architecture, the same kind of processes uh, at their operations in South America, uh, perhaps in Europe, uh, and uh, take what they've learned from this and, and roll it out to those international markets. They, they, I, I, they really have to in order to get the most out of this benefit from the scale of this. Sam, let's wrap it up this way. Um, you are an engineer and you've been working in the automotive industry your entire career. Uh, the pace of innovation to an outsider, the pace of innovation appears to be just accelerating at a tremendous rate, driven a lot by the Chinese. And I'm wondering, where do we go from here? <laughs> that's uh, that's the, the multi-billion dollar question. Um, you know, I think, you know, despite the uh, preferences of uh, the current administration in Washington to eradicate all things electrified. Um, I think you know, we, we are going to keep moving forward with electrification. The rest of the world is doing it, uh, China especially. And you know, China is proving that, uh, you know, that, that people will adopt EVs uh, mm -hmm. if given the right products at the right price points. And so, um, yeah, and, and as you said, you know, they're moving into the global south. They're moving into China. Uh, and so the U.S. industry, the North American industry, needs to stay competitive with that. They, they, need, they need to keep moving forward with electrification. They cannot abandon this or they will be left behind. Uh, yeah, and the combination of uh, being technically obsolete if they do nothing but big internal combustion engines, uh, as well, you know, combined with the growing antipathy towards American products because of policies right now uh, would leave them in a very bad place. They, it, it's, it would be an existential crisis. So I think the industry needs to keep moving forward. We're going to continue to see developments on software, electronics, on battery technology. Battery technology is going to keep advancing. Uh, and we'll, we'll probably continue to see more advances on the manufacturing side as well to help further take cost out of these vehicles uh, and make them accessible to more people. Sam, as always, uh, thank you very much for this. My pleasure, Mark. I'm always good to talk to you.